Uh, our topic uh, today is, is democracy in crisis? Uh, I'll give you a simple bottom line, I think it is. I've had this experience, which I'm sure all of you have had in the last few months. You cannot begin a topic on the weather, gardening, without it getting back to Donald Trump eventually. Uh, because it's been a very, uh, it's been a very uh, peculiar year. Uh, you've seen a kind of rise of populism uh, of a sort that we've really never seen in the United States before. You had Brexit uh, prior to that. You've got populist parties in uh, many democracies in Europe. And the question is, what's going on? And I think particularly now, uh, you know, the focus shouldn't be, uh, you know, we need to think about the, the more structural causes of what's been going on. What exactly is going on? What are the structural causes for why democracy is in crisis? Structural root causes can be excruciatingly difficult to find, especially in a global system with 185 countries, 6,000 languages, and 7 billion people, all driven by the iron law of survival of the fittest. How can anyone possibly understand such a complicated problem? It is of the highest importance in the art of detection to be able to recognize out of a number of facts which are incidental and which are vital. Otherwise, your attention will be dissipated instead of being concentrated. Sherlock Holmes, The Rygate Puzzle. The engineers at Twink.org have concentrated our attention on what matters by following a process that fits the problem. How the system improvement process works was described in the previous film. It's a fill-in-the-blanks framework. Each empty cell helps you ask the right question at each fork in the long road to solving the problem. First, you decompose the one big problem into sub-problems, starting with the standard three sub-problems present in all difficult social problems. We found a fourth one, so that gave us four sub-problems to analyze. Here are the analysis results. We won't explain the details, just the essential core of what the analysis found. Each of the four columns, A, B, C, and D, contains a social force diagram. Notice how the analysis spent twice the amount of time analyzing the superficial layer. That provided the dozens of insights necessary to correctly understand the fundamental layer. It's a complex analysis because it's a complex problem. But there are ways to cut through that complexity by doing what Sherlock Holmes did and concentrating one's attention on that which is vital. 
What really matters is the root cause forces and how they interact. Each of the four columns is a sub-problem containing a root cause force. We can move the four sub-problems over here and arrange them according to how they interact. This shows the high-level structure of the problem. What you're looking at was the biggest surprise of the analysis. The unsolved problems are symptoms of a deeper problem, one we've come to call the broken political system problem. That is the real problem to solve, because the root cause forces of the problem cause such unbelievably destructive side effects. The side effects include more than environmental unsustainability. They also include economic and social unsustainability. This diagram is our roadmap to solving the problem, so we've got to understand it. Subproblems A, B, and C combine to form the broken political system problem. Like gravity and magnetism, the root cause forces are invisible. You can't see them. You can't touch them. But these invisible forces control the entire human system, like a giant octopus that can crawl anywhere and do anything. like the eight arms of a crawling octopus that can take it anywhere and grab hold of anything, the root cause forces seep through the entire human system, causing economic, environmental, and social unsustainability. That includes all of the unsolved problems. Therefore, the real problem to solve is the broken political system problem. The three types of sustainability form what's known as the three pillars of sustainability. If all the pillars are healthy, that's a sure sign that democracy is healthy. But the pillars are not healthy. The octopus of the root cause forces has crawled over the entire planet, silently gnawing and chewing away at the system. The octopus has damaged the system so badly that the three pillars are crumbling apart and collapsing as we speak. Democracy is in crisis because of the broken political system problem. By broken, we mean the world's political systems should be solving the unsolved problems because their solution would benefit the common good. The vast majority of people want to solve these problems, but they're not being solved. So something is terribly broken. The tragic result is unsolved problems like climate change and environmental sustainability. Economic unsustainability causes high economic inequality and large recessions. Social unsustainability causes a bunch of problems like discrimination, corruption, war, and poverty. Social unsustainability also causes hate-based authoritarianism. That ever-growing list of unsolved problems, and especially problem number nine, indicate it is not the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama argued back in 1992. Fukuyama felt that democracy has proven itself to be a superior alternative to all other forms of government and would become the norm 
and thereby end our long history of experimenting with different forms of government. But that was in 1992. Today, in 2017, we see that history has not ended. The rise of authoritarian leaders like Putin and Trump and the growing power of communist China signal that history is running backwards from the democracy period to the authoritarian ruler period. At first glance, this looks like depressingly bad news. History is running backwards and we know why. The root cause forces explain why the human system is locked into this course of massive self-destruction. That humanity is locked into a course propelling our species to its doom has long been noted. The tragedy of the commons develops in this way. Picture a pasture open to all. It is to be expected that each herdsman will try to keep as many cattle as possible in the commons. But this is the conclusion reached by each and every rational herdsman sharing a commons. Therein lies the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit in a world that is limited. Ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom in the commons brings ruin to all. Garrett Hardin, 1968. Garrett Hardin logically saw the coming tragedy. Others saw it too and went one step further. They modeled the problem. Pioneering simulation models like World 3 and Limits to Growth simulated the forces propelling society to its ecological doom. But none of these models were based on root cause analysis. As a result, Despite the popularity of these models and mountains of work by activists, all the solutions put forth have failed. All that solution failure means we have a little bad news. Look at the gray area. The dotted lines are predicted and the solid lines are actual. After 40 years, there's very little difference between the two which means the general predictions of the World 3 model are right on track. Collapse lies dead ahead because of all those failed solutions. By considerable contrast, the model behind the Thwink.org analysis was built with the right tools from the start so we didn't fall into the superficial solutions trap. This trap occurs when people assume intermediate causes are root causes. They don't use root cause analysis, so they can't see the fundamental layer and can't see its root causes. All they can see is the superficial layer. We also didn't fall into the one subproblem trap. This occurs when problem solvers assume a single subproblem is the only one to solve, which makes the problem impossible to solve because it remains too complex to analyze correctly. The one subproblem trap gives you tunnel vision and shrinks what you can see to only the original problem that you're working on. Activists have unfortunately fallen into both traps. All they can see is one eighth of the structure of the problem. If that's all you can see, then all you can throw at the problem is one symptomatic solution after another on only the original problem. Unless the laws of physics change, that's not going to work. And it hasn't worked. Symptomatic solutions don't work on people and they don't work on systems.
Perhaps you'd like a little proof that modern activists have fallen into both traps. Okay, here goes. The biggest overall problem is environmental sustainability, which includes climate change. The most influential analysis of that problem, by far, was the Limits to Growth study, published in 1972 and revised in 1992 and 2004. That analysis fell into both traps. From our perspective, all the Limits to Growth team did was the first analysis step of subproblem D. That step found the dominant loops causing the symptoms. Oh. My. Gosh. The engineers at Twink.org were stunned when they figured this out. It explains so much. It explains why, despite the efforts of millions of activists, we've made such small progress on the unsolved problems. All those activists are doing is what the Limits to Growth team did. In other words, 100% of the world's activists have fallen into the two traps and they don't even know it. All they can rationally analyze is a tiny fraction of the problem. Everything else is a guess. It's bad news that activism fell into both traps. It's more bad news that we have the broken political system problem. That one problem is insidiously blocking solution of all the unsolved problems. But once you can clearly see these things and their causes, all that bad news can be turned into good news. Because we have a rational explanation for why we're unable to solve the unsolved problems, we have what looks like extremely good news. That good news begins by not blindly confining our analysis to one-eighth of the problem. By using the right tools, we can see eight times as much. That's our vision. That's our dream. We want all activists to be able to see all the blocks of whatever problem they're working on. We want to avoid the trap of only being able to see block four. Because we're using the right tools, our blindfold has come off. We can take full advantage of the laws of physics and high leverage points because we can see all eight blocks and thus all the social forces involved. We can see the root cause forces causing the four sub problems, the superficial solution forces that don't work, and the fundamental solution forces that will work if the analysis is reasonably correct. Night has become day. we can thus offer some exceptionally good news. Once the root causes are resolved, the system undergoes a mode change and automatically wants to solve the unsolved problems, because that's now the goal of the system. This simplifies the task ahead enormously. Activists don't have to solve the nine problems and all sorts of other problems that are symptoms of the deeper problem. We only have to solve one problem the broken political system problem. That is the real problem to solve. A goal should scare you a little and excite you a lot. Joe Vitale. Goals control systems. A key principle in systems thinking is that all goals are part of balancing feedback loops. So if we need to understand why a system is behaving a certain way, 
such as to not solve the unsolved problems, we must understand the balancing feedback loops involved and the goals of those loops. There is no alternative. So now we know that the key to solving the entire problem lies in one little thing, understanding the system's current goal. That can be found in the root cause of subproblem B. It's called the life form proper coupling subproblem because two life forms are involved. Currently, the human system is dominated by Homo sapiens and Corporatus profitus, better known as large for profit corporations. The two life forms should be properly coupled by the right feedback loops so they work together in harmony, but they're not working together in harmony because they have two opposing goals. The goal of Homo sapiens is to optimize long-term quality of life for all. Corpus profitus has a completely different goal, the short-term maximization of profits. These goals are so mutually exclusive, they cannot both be achieved in the same system. One life form will win, and one will lose. Guess who's winning? Which life form controls most jobs, determines the path of nearly all new technology, produces the most products and services, and basically controls elections and political decisions by way of its unlimited financial resources? And which life form defines the evolution of culture to its own advantage through demand advertising? ownership of the media, and new product design? The answer is obvious. It's the large for-profit corporation. Another key principle states that over time, the goal of the dominant agent in a social system becomes the goal of the system. Given this principle and the competition between corporatus profitus and homo sapiens, the root cause follows. The root cause of subproblem B is mutually exclusive goals between the top two social life forms, corporatus profitus and homo sapiens. A simpler way to say this is that corporatus profitus has the wrong goal of short-term maximization of profits. That root cause force is so powerful it's driving the entire global human system to ruin. Goals control systems. If the goal of the human system is to maximize the short-term value of profits, then the system is going to do exactly that. Anything that gets in the way of that goal will be pushed aside, so the root cause force of subproblem B has tremendous side effects. Solving the climate change problem would reduce short-term profits so corporations are leading the charge to not solving that problem. The same holds for the entire environmental sustainability problem. The pattern continues. High economic inequality benefits the rich, the corporate life form's chief ally, and reduces the power of everyone else. Large recessions benefit corporations enormously because until the bubble bursts, Profits are sky high. And then come the side effects of social unsustainability. That causes discrimination because politicians working for corporatist profitus need a false enemy to keep their supporters in a constant state of fear and anxiety that can only be relieved by supporting that politician. 
That's why Trump is so hard on immigrants, blacks, women, and poor people. Another side effect is corruption. Follow the money. The money trail runs from corporations to politicians to those who need payoffs for their cooperation. You want someone to do something? If you dangle enough money in front of them, they will do it most of the time. Money talks. War and preparing for it is highly profitable. So the military industrial complex pushes as hard as it can, day and night, to push the fear of war hot button. It works. It also fools voters into voting for strong leaders who rattle their swords against all sorts of false enemies who can only be controlled by military might and a strong nation. Why in the world should corporations help solve the poverty problem? When doing so takes a cut out of today's profits. Alms for the poor? That's for people to do, not corporations. And poor people work for lower wages, which increases profits. And then there's the rise of hate-based authoritarianism. Authoritarians only care about money and power, though they are pretty good at hiding that in a giant smokescreen of deception so they can get elected or stay elected. So they are totally against solving common good problems, which includes all the unsolved problems. So that's how the main root cause of the broken political system problem works. The root cause is the wrong goal for corporatus profitus. That wrong goal causes all the unsolved problems. So maybe those who've been saying that money is the root of all evil knew about this root cause all the time. It all boils down to one thing. The human system has the wrong goal. Goals control systems. Given this knowledge, it's pretty clear that the broken political system problem is the problem to solve. Let's look at one possible solution. But there's a little warning. The solution is counterintuitive and likely to be highly controversial. But if the main root cause for all those unsolved problems is correct, then the only controversy should be why didn't we fix that root cause long ago? The main root cause is that corporatus profitus has the wrong goal of short-term maximization of profits. Corporation 1.0 is where we are today. The goal of that life form causes corporations to only want to take care of themselves. A high leverage point for resolving that root cause is pretty clear. It's time to re-engineer the corporate life form into one with the right goal. That goal should be the same as the goal of Homo sapiens which is to optimize long-term quality of life for all. This would cause corporations to switch from taking care of themselves to taking care of people. In other words, corporations should not be giant wealth concentration machines. They should be trusted servants working for the common good of all by providing needed goods and services. Until we make this fundamental change, all we can expect is that the unsolved problems will continue to grow worse, because that's how the system is designed. Now that we know the main root cause, we have a choice. Goals control systems. Once we move from where we are now, Corporation 1.0, to something like Corporation 2.0, the human system will now have the right goal. It will naturally want to solve the unsolved problems and optimize the general welfare of all, 
which is what democracy was invented for. That will be a rather pleasant world to live in. And it can be done, because we the people still have a choice. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Attributed to Margaret Mead. That's the fundamental tenet of modern activism. According to this strategy, a small group of fired-up activists can change the world. They do this with a three-step process that focuses on speaking truth to power. The process works on the solved problems, so it should work on any problem. But it doesn't. Why is this? Why doesn't speaking truth to power work? Because of the root cause forces. Remember that key principle? Over time, the goal of the dominant agent in a social system becomes the goal of the system. The dominant life form is corporatist profitus, not people. So the implicit goal of the system is the short-term maximization of profits. This causes the system to strongly resist solving the unsolved problems. That's known as change resistance. Here's how change resistance works. Traditional activists conceive of a solution. They really want that solution to be adopted. They do that by creating solution elements. And then they start promoting those solutions by speaking truth to power. Why doesn't this work? Because due to the root cause forces, there's a hidden brick wall of change resistance. The brick wall is so strong that when you start promoting your solutions, the arrows hit the wall, bounce off, and fall to the ground, becoming an endless graveyard of failed solutions. A few make it over the wall, just enough to give activists a little hope to keep trying. But it's a false hope. The brick wall is so strong that traditional solutions are simply not going to work due to the wall of systemic change resistance. Here's a question. Which is easier, trying to shoot enough arrows at that wall and hope that a few make it over, or resolving the root causes so the wall disappears? Here's an example. In 1997, the U.S. Senate voted a shocking 95 to 0 against signing the Kyoto Protocol, despite the fact that Al Gore was vice president at the time. Not a single senator could be persuaded to support mankind's best hope for solving the climate change problem. That is change resistance. The root cause of successful change resistance appears to be low truth literacy. Too many people are fooled into voting for politicians who say they're for the people, but in fact are working for corporatist profitus. For example, corporations are leading the assault on environmentalism. Sharon Bader has documented how it's done using the finest spin money can buy. Spin works because as long as truth literacy is low, people can't tell the difference between truth and propaganda. Here's more proof. 35 days before the 2016 U.S. election, the Washington Post analyzed how much deception Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were using. Here's what they found. The data says it all. Clinton's ratings 
follow a normal distribution, while 65% of Trump's statements received four Pinocchios, the highest possible rating for falsehood. Trump's core strategy is deception, while Clinton's is the truth. In other words, the best liar won. That will continue as long as voters can't tell the difference between truth and deception. There's one more thing. It's not politicians like Trump who need changing. Get rid of Trump and another bad politician will take his place. We need to do something rather different. We need to change the system by finding its root cause forces, finding the feedback loops causing those forces, and then changing the structure of those feedback loops so as to change the fundamental behavior of the system. There's another reason activists have been unable to solve the unsolved problems. In the long run, subproblem C is the most important subproblem of them all. Politicians are democracy's problem solvers. They solve problems by creating solution models, which describe the problem, the solution, and how the solution will be managed. All social systems evolve. If a solution does not evolve along with its problem, solution model drift occurs. If that drift becomes excessive, then the solution will no longer work and the problem will reappear. The reason this subproblem is so critical is that over the years, a government accumulates solutions to a multitude of problems like the list of unsolved problems. If too many problems reappear, the system will become overwhelmed and unable to solve its backlog of problems, not to mention new problems. This generally causes political collapse. The classic ancient example of collapse due to excessive solution drift was the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The classic modern example is failure to solve the climate change problem. Each failure to take action to solve a problem is an error. Each of these errors is a defect produced by the political decision-making process. Therefore, the root cause of excessive solution model drift is a high rate of defects in the political decision-making process. There's pretty strong proof this is the root cause. The defect rate of political decisions must be high because we can see all those unsolved problems and their severity. What we've got here is a too many defects problem. The business world solved that problem long ago with the practice of formal process control. The whole idea is that tight management of your key processes lets you control their defect rate. The lower the rate, the higher the quality of the final product. But the practice of process control has only swept the technical world. Soon, I would hope, it will sweep the social world in the form of process control in the political decision-making process. When it does, we can start to say goodbye to the broken political system problem.
let's take a look at the high leverage points for solving the broken political system problem. Each subproblem, A, B, and C, has a root cause. The three root cause forces are so insidious and powerful, they have allowed the corporate life form to capture total control of the human system. Punny little Homo sapiens doesn't know it, but he is no longer the master of his own destiny. Instead, Corpus Prophetus is at the wheel, driving global civilization down the road of history to its doom. All the proof you need is in the nine unsolved problems and the root cause of subproblem B. I wish it wasn't so, but there is little evidence that any solutions are having any significant effect on the real problem to solve, the broken political system problem. But that can change. If we examine the summary of analysis closely, we can see that each root cause has a high leverage point. A high leverage point is a place in the structure of a system where solutions push in order to resolve a connected root cause. For example, the Queen Mary II is 1,100 feet long and weighs 175 million pounds. If you were the captain, you wouldn't push on the side of the ship to steer. You'd turn the ship's wheel to push on the rudder, which is the high leverage point. Solving systemic problems is all about finding the right high leverage points. Now here's a discovery that to me is simply amazing. It's something else we never expected when we started. There have been no large-scale efforts to push on any of the high leverage points. But this is to be expected because activists have not been using root cause analysis. It thus appears that the unsolved problems can be solved if activists unite and push on the high leverage points like these together. Oh my gosh, wow. If there ever was a golden opportunity, this is it. It kind of takes my breath away just thinking about it. It's like the field of medicine before antibiotics like penicillin were discovered. Nobody had any idea that was possible. But science now knows that the root cause of deadly infections like tuberculosis, pneumonia, and gangrene is an insufficient immune response. That response is multiplied a thousand times with antibiotics, and the root cause is resolved. Old-fashioned, superficial solutions like bloodletting with leeches and knives to open so-called clogged channels are now quite a bit out of style. Modern doctors don't use the term root cause analysis, but that's exactly what they're doing. What you're looking at is a whole new way of thinking about solving social problems. It has the potential to destroy one world, the old paradigm, and replace it with another world, the new paradigm. Once you understand it, the analysis offers some extremely good news because it demonstrates that the right process can lead to the right results, and that the sustainability problem, and all its side effects, is solvable. There is no reason our civilization must follow the pattern of collapse set by the decline and fall of Rome, or Easter Island, or any number of past civilizations. We have an alternative.
On June 12th of 2005, Steve Jobs gave the speech of a lifetime. In fact, it was about his lifetime. To Steve Jobs, living was all about doing what you love. So that's what he talked about when he gave the commencement address to the Stanford University class of 2005. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometime life, sometimes life's gonna hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is gonna fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking, don't settle. Find what you love, do what you love, don't settle. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly what we've done here at Thwink.org. We believe that activists can do what you love by thinking like an engineer, such as the engineers who designed the Eiffel Tower. We kept on looking for a way to go deep and help solve the sustainability problem. We didn't settle for anything less than what Steve would have settled for, a breakthrough path to achieving our vision. Public interest activism is all about doing what you love. Activists don't do what they love for the money. We do it because we love what we do and have a guiding vision of what's possible, if we can figure out a way to get there. The engineers at Thwink.org have come to the conclusion that maybe, just maybe, we have a way to get there. It's the path shown in this film series. It's a new path. It's a risky path, fraught with danger, because it's never been done before. But that's always been true for new problems that have never been solved, but must be solved. Here's where we are. If you are an activist working on a really tough problem and want to do what you love, it all begins with thinking like an engineer. Engineers use the right tools. No matter what the problem is, solving it always requires tools that fit the problem. Can a surgeon perform an operation without a scalpel? Can a carpenter build a house without a hammer, or these days a nail gun? No. Without the right tools, a problem is unsolvable. Social system engineers need three key tools. The first is social force diagrams, so that all your work is focused on finding and resolving the root cause forces. Social force diagrams keep you from getting trapped on the superficial layer and never managing to find the fundamental layer where the root causes lie. The second tool is the six laws of root cause analysis. So you can more correctly perform root cause analysis. The first law is that all problems arise from their root causes. The third tool is a process that fits the problem, such as the system improvement process. Once you have a formal process, the process can be continuously improved until it's good enough to solve the problem. The right process will lead to the right results, as millions of successful businesses have demonstrated. 
The heart of engineering has always been analysis. Using the right tools, we first decomposed the one big problem into the right smaller sub-problems. This was actually the hardest step, and we got it wrong the first few times. But eventually, we had tight, crisp sub-problems that snapped everything into focus. Then we analyzed the superficial layer for each sub-problem. There we confirmed in considerable detail why so many social problems can't be solved. It's because their solutions are unknowingly directed to intermediate causes rather than root causes. Then we pushed on to the fundamental layer where the root causes lie. As expected, we found them. But when we put it all together, we found something that we never expected at the start, the broken political system problem which is the real problem to solve. Solve it, and we've solved the democracy in crisis problem and the hate-based authoritarianism problem. And we'll be well on the road to solving the other unsolved problems, including the most critical one of them all, climate change. That's where we are today. We've completed a preliminary analysis and ready for the next step, which is testing. But we can't do this alone. We need your help. I'm not going to ask you to be green or be part of a campaign or call your elected representatives. That's grassroots activism and it doesn't work on the unsolved problems. Changing one mind at a time doesn't work. We don't want to change the deck chairs on the Titanic while the ship is sinking. We want to change the system so the ship doesn't sink. There's several ways you can help. First, we're looking for small local problems to analyze and solve. By local, we mean the problem must have what we suspect are local root causes so that the root causes can be resolved by local changes to the system. By small, we mean the problem can be analyzed and the solution applied by a handful of activists, plus the organizations we're working with. Second, think about existing projects, those you're working on. Are the projects hitting any roadblocks? How successful are they? Do any projects look like they need the right tools or part of them? Give us a call. We can help you assess a project to see whether it would benefit from the THWINK tools. Third, you might have a new project that could run a lot better by using the right tools from the start. Maybe the problem is so tricky to solve that it desperately needs a rigorous engineering approach and a heavy dose of root cause analysis. There's one more way you can help. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. We agree. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. That's what Twink.org is trying to make possible. With the right tools and the right analysis, you too can do great work and make a dent in the universe. <laughs>